by now you have confessed your sins before the Lord. And so I want you to have a special prayer in your own heart that God speak to my heart today on this Easter. Speak to my heart. Give me a truth that I need in my life. That's connected with the resurrection of Christ. Give me something, Father, to encourage my heart. And so, our Father, I thank you today. Our hearts are encouraged because we're still alive and still proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. We still have our evangelistic boots on out of Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. We have a desire and a heart to live for you. To have a personal relationship with God as our Abba Father, our Daddy. I was so impressed with Jonah in the midst of an evil, corrupt civilization that grieved the heart of God that he had created man. Yet this man walked with God. In the Hifbael, he walked with God. In other words, he walked even realizing nobody's walking with him. It's a reflexive father, and we thank you for that Hebrew. He walked alone. And every day he went out and he preached. Every day he lived the exemplary life in Christ. Because that's the only way you live. It's not, it's not how the world lives that dictates it. What God says he wants us to live. Encourage our hearts today, Father, as we look at the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Where's that power? The, the, where's the power that raised Jesus from the dead? Where does that power today in this world? Where is that power? Teach us that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're here. If you would turn to the book of Romans. Honestly, I should have told you that our passage, our text passage, is Romans 8, 1 through 11. But that's so much for me to teach in an hour I broke it down into two parts, even though it is one part. In verses 1 through 8, Paul introduces in chapter 8 an important subject matter of where the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ dwells today in the world. Where does the power dwell in the world today? And so what I'm going to show you comes out of my passage, which is 9, 10, 11. I'd like to, for you to put your eyes on that as I read it. And, and then I'll explain how the others fit. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. However, connects verses 1 through 8, and especially verse 8. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. I want that to sink a minute. If indeed, now watch, there's four ifs, all first class conditions. They're really important. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, what was his thesis? Now look, here's his thesis. Here's his thesis. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. That's a thesis idea of the first class condition. And the word, however, feeds off from those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, there's a thesis to these four. There are four first-class conditional cla class conditions. I'll come back to that. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone, there's my second one, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not, he does not belong to him. Here's my third one. If Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Here's my fourth. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you.
based on verse 11, where does the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, first of all, what was that power? What was the power that raised Jesus from the dead? Let's read that again. If, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, are you with me? So what was the power that raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in your mortal body? The Holy Spirit. He, watch what Paul said. He dwells where? In you. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins personally. See, I meet a lot of Christian young people who grew up in a Christian home, and that's good, that have had information about Jesus Christ, but no hard information. It's never become personal. They, they have learned about Christ academically and not spiritually. They know that Christ died on the cross. They know he was buried, and, and, and they believe it and believe that he was raised, but they have never personally committed their life to that for their salvation. You go, go, you're not going to heaven by academics. You're going to heaven by the blood of Christ applied to your life when you believe it personally, not academically. And I've met kids who could quote more scripture than I could who got saved. Who got saved? Academic exercise doesn't get you saved. It gets you religion, it gets you to God, but it doesn't get you, it doesn't get you to salvation. Boy, you've got to understand that. I meet mean, so many kids, I'm telling you, they've got head knowledge and not heart knowledge. So, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and that's a first-class condition, it says he does, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. That life's eternal life. How does he do it? He does it through his spirit who dwells in you. He See, he said that twice. The power that raised Jesus from the place of the dead lives in your mortal body as eternal life. The power of God is in the believer's life. Now listen to me. Where in your life? Where's the power, where's the power reside? In your body. It resides in your body, inside your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know that the Holy Spirit dwells inside your body? Now listen to me. And your body becomes the temple of God, naos in the Greek, a place where God dwells. Listen to verse 20. Therefore, your body is not your own. <laughs> well, I wish I could get you to understand that. Your body's not your own. It has been bought with the price of Calvary. It was bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Your body is not your own. Once you get saved, your body's not your own. And there's only two ways you can live in your body. Only two ways you can live. You can live carnal or spiritual. You can live in the flesh or in the spirit. If you live in the flesh, what's verse 8 say? If you live in the flesh, and you can live in the flesh, that's called carnal. How do I know I'm, in, how do I know I'm carnal? Evidence of personal sin. I can live in the flesh. I can live carnal. That's a choice. And if I do, I will be disciplined. My heavenly Father will discipline me. He said it in our passage today on the Eucharist. 
not to be disciplined. You can read about it in Hebrews 12. You will be disciplined. You will be disciplined not because God is angry with you, because he loves you. You should read that. And he doesn't treat you as an illegitimate child or a bastard, King James, but as a real son that belongs to him. You should read that. You should read that in Hebrews 12. It's a powerful passage. You see, the power of the resurrection of Christ is the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside your body. It's the power plant that lights up the world. It's the power plant that lights up the world. Your life is the light of God. It's set on a hill so many can see, and your light can be a light to their lives. How many people does your light in Christ shine on in your periphery? Probably more than you imagine. But it should be shining. Because in carnality, the light goes off. It, it's still there. The switch goes off. You switched off from walking in the spirit to walking in the flesh. You chose to gratify the, the desires of your flesh to sin. And nothing good comes from that. Whatever you thought you were going to get from it, you will not get. Oh, he'll probably marry me. Mm, probably not. If he does, he won't stay because he's a player. Probably won't stay. You'll have a child or two and he'll be gone because he's a player. And when are you going to wake up? You turn the light off. The, the power system in your life is gone. You imagine how tough it is when the lights, when the whole power system goes out in your house, can't wash your hair, you can't take a bath, can't watch television, can't, get, can't do that, your cell phone goes dead, now you're really in trouble, right? You're panicking. <laughs> Who turned the switch off? You did. Now, let me show you some things. In chapter 8, Paul sets up where the power system goes. In verse 1, he says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You believe the gospel of Christ? He puts you, you, are, you are 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. You've been born again. And listen, once you're in Christ, at the moment of salvation, you are in Christ, you're no longer under what? No longer what? Condemned. No longer under condemnation. None. Zero. Zip. Out. Why is it so difficult for you not to read that and believe that? Well, somebody will say, well, when you commit a sin, boy, if you die of that sin, you're in trouble. You're not even in trouble with God. Because he's disciplined you as a good father. And everything's come down to the day, and he just reschedules. He just reschedules. You're going to die. He just reschedules your day. No condemnation in your life. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. Why? Because the blood of Christ, when he died on that cross, he did away with Adam's sin. Condemnation is part of it's one of 13 judicial charges of Adam, Adam's sin. It's the condemnation of Adam's sin. Where for, Romans 5, 12 through 21. You know that well enough you didn't have to write it? You know that passage well enough? Uh, that's a giant passage of Scripture. I, I can't tell you how many times I quote that. It's giant. So, there's no condemnation. Now watch the positive. Now look what you do get when you get saved. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. Has set me free. See, that's at Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Has set me free from the law of sin and death. Set free. 
The moment I believe in the gospel of Christ, there's no more condemnation. No, there isn't. I, my life has been set free from death and sin and condemnation. Listen, the law, I live now by the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. Do you know that Paul does something really interesting? This is a sidebar. This is not going to cost anything. But it's no accident that Paul wrote Christ first and then Jesus. Because when he talks about Christ, he's talking about the old covenant person who has been fulfilled by the person called Jesus of Nazareth, the historical incarnated Son of God. I'm just telling you why Paul does that. You see, you and I live under the spirit of life, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and it has set us free from death and sin. Then he goes on to talk about how the law is weak, but God sent his son and there condemned sin in his flesh, in verse 3, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Who are the we? Those are the people who have been born again by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those who are according to the flesh, watch this now, set their minds. Nobody sets your mind. In fact, some people are so prone to not letting anybody set their mind that we call them bullheaded or hardheaded, right? Because they're set in their ways. That idea is used here. For those who are according to the flesh have set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Where is your life? If it's in the flesh, you're involved in temporal death. The things of God are not, is not, are not important in your life. The things of God aren't important. They're secondary. What is important is the desires of the flesh. Because Listen, because you think, see, the lust of the flesh is always for gratification. You think you're going to get something you're not going to get. My, 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 why won't you... You are never going to get what you think you're going to get because sin condemns, it doesn't bless. You're never going to get it and the payday down the pike is going to be more miserable than you can imagine. I go through this every day of my life with people who are out there 10 or 15 years in their marriage. And they have just struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled because they're still in the flesh and not in the spirit. You can't help anybody. You can't help anybody in the misery and the muck of their life if they choose to gratify their flesh rather than, than gratify their spirit of God in their life. Somewhere you've got to make a stand for Christ. You've got to set your mind... Not just your clock. You've got to set your mind. And when you set your mind and do the things of the Spirit of God, your heart will be set to do those things. You set your mind and then experience God's power in your life and then it sets in your heart and it's become a heart choice. Not a hard one, a heart choice. You don't set your mind on the things of God where the power of God... Listen, the only power in this life that you need is in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
your life is miserable because you've turned off the light of Christ and chose to live in the darkness of the flesh. You've got to quit doing that. You've got to quit doing it in your dating relationship, in your marriage, in your family, in your church, your community. You've got to quit doing that. There's no power in the flesh. There's no power of God in the flesh. That's the story of the resurrection. That's Easter. I pray to God this message will be in your heart this Easter of 2021, and it will never leave there. He will bug you to death until you get this in your life. He saved you for a reason greater than yourself. My, 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 my. God didn't save you for yourself. You're self-centered, egotistic. That's because of the flesh. That's not the real person God died for. The real person is the person who God saved, knows in his heart, once lived for God, and now lives for himself. And he's miserable. Uh, the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on death is hostile towards God, for it is not subject itself to the law of God, for it does not, it's not even able to do so. Therefore, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You can't turn the light off and think you can please God. Your life is not going to be filled with the life of God nor the peace of God. Because he's a loving father and he's going to discipline you. And he's going to make your life as uncomfortable as he can. So I learned two things from Paul in the first eight verses. That's important to my lesson today. Eternal life in a mortal body. The first doctrinal truth that I learned is the law of spirit of eternal life. Has set me free. The law of the spirit of eternal life. Thank you. That's an amen from the highway. I'll take it. That's the only way I can get it. I'll take it. For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and death. The second doctrine that stands out to my, my mind, the mind set on the indwelling Holy Spirit and not on the flesh is where life and peace comes from. You want life and peace, you should. God saved you to live in life and peace. I'm talking about where your life is so fulfilled. It is so full of God that God, God blesses you overflowingly. He blesses you when, when you don't even realize it. You go like, I can't take anymore. I'm serious. I'm serious. Where God blesses your life so much, you go like, look, 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 look. Ease up a little bit. <laughs> I, I can't take the blessings. I mean, I'm, I'm too overwhelmed by it, God. You been there? Huh? Probably at least one time in your life you had a Christmas like that. Huh? Where you got everything your heart could imagine and more. Think about that. Imagine that every day. <laughs> I know it sounds like a fairy tale, don't it? Huh? That's so far removed from where you are today, but it ought to be right where you're at the center of your life. Where God's life just is overwhelming, and the peace of God is so overwhelming, and the joy of God is so overwhelming, and you ought to study the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. No matter what the devil throws your way, it, is, it just bounce off. You know the fiery darts? Uh, he's got them. And he's sure firing them. Huh? But if you got the breastplate of righteousness? Now I told you that in, when we get to chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, there are four Greek markers. Let me tell you what these, a first-class condition is. I wrote it on your paper. Because 
people on the internet sometimes don't understand this because they don't go to a teaching church and sometimes I don't stop to explain these things. John stays after me this all the time and uh, I, I try to do better with it. Here's a first class condition. Y you, have, you have a protasis in the Greek language, that's the if. And you have an apotesis, conclusion, that's the then. There's always an if and a then. And, when there, and, any t and it's always if and then then. Now, to pay attention. Sometimes God switches them. He'll put the then first and the if later. And when he does, it's for great emphasis. Okay? Just tell you up time. There's always an if. Now, first class condition means that if it's true in the if, it's true in the then. Say true. I just want to see if you're still awake. <laughs> I know when I, got, when I got through preaching, some of you were ready to go home. <laughs> so I thought I'd just see if, you went, if you've already went, but your body's still here. So every once in a while I have to check that for my own comfort. Four, so we got four of these. We got four of these. We got four of them. And they're all working off the premise. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Based on verses 1 through 8, and, and emphasized those who are in the flesh cannot please God. <clears throat> you with me? <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> those in the flesh cannot please God. So then the question is, <clears throat> then how do I do it? And so Paul's answer is 9, 10, and 11. Of course, he's going to go through the rest of the chapter. <clears throat> I'm just dealing with the power. He, the, you know, you got to read the rest of the chapter to get the whole story. But here's 9, 10, and 11. <clears throat> the power system. Where's the power system? <clears throat> Those in the flesh cannot please God. Well, then how can I? Well, I, I can always please God if I set my mind on the spirit. I can't please God if I set it on the flesh because in the flesh you can't please God, right? Da, 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 da. You know, you got to put two and two together. Can't do it all for you. So in Romans 9 1, Paul gave the apotheosis then. <clears throat> watch this, verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. He put the then first. Look, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. So what's his emphasis? His emphasis is on the first part of the verse. You are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. He did that for emphasis. How important, oh listen, how important is, it, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life? It's essential. When did he get it? At the point of salvation. It's one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit of salvation because you live in the church age under the new covenant. See, he's making emphasis of the importance of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Do you see that? Paul gave a third doctrinal truth, this time from 8-9, that the, holy, the indwelling Holy Spirit, IHS, the indwelling Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the church age believer's body at the moment of grace salvation. John 14, 16, and 17, dynamite. <clears throat> Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit takes up residence, and he will, once he takes after Pentecost or at Pentecost and, and on, he will indwell, listen to me, forever. He will indwell for how long? Forever. Forever. In eight, in the, also in the, eighth, in the eighth chapter, verse 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to him. Now he came back to a normal situation. If then. If... <clears throat> Anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, and there are some who don't, then here's, here's another truth. He does not belong to him, God. 
See, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. No man can come to the Father except through me. But when you come through Christ to God, you are with God forever. And to show you proof, he put the Holy Spirit inside your body forever, and he sealed it until the day of redemption, Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30. My, 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 people. My, my, my. So there's a fourth doctrinal principle. If anyone does not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he or she does not belong to God in Christ. When do I get it? The moment you believe that Jesus died personally for your sins. Listen, your name is on that cross. Oh, boy. I don't mind working. I don't mind working. Listen, I don't work for money. I work for the Lord. So you couldn't buy this. So time is. I'm in Galatians 2.20. have been crucified with Christ. Now, who's the I? You. I mean, Paul wrote this for us. If Paul understands I was crucified with Christ. When? When I was a religious Jew. Persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. Putting people into prison and death. He hung on that cross for me. I was crucified. Paul took it personally. He went to the cross and said, I believe that Jesus, I believe that you died for me. And he did. That's John 3, 16. And he did. And Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. He lives in that state of mind. That's his mindset. That's his mindset. I was crucified with Christ. Watch this now. I still got old King James with me. Nevertheless, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, cross, and gave himself up for me, the cross. Let me tell you, Jesus dying on a cross has got to be personal, not academic. You've got to see yourself on the cross. I was crucified with Christ. And now I am being persecuted for Christ. Do you know him? Because if you don't, you're not going to have this power in you. This awesome power that can raise from the dead. That lives in your mortal body. Listen. Listen. The power that can raise from the dead the Lord Jesus Christ from the place of death lives inside your mortal body and we call it eternal life. My, my, my. In verse 10, Paul writes, if Christ is in you indwelling, and he does something interesting. Do not miss this because you can't see it in English. See the words though? See the word though? In the Greek language, that's men, M-E-N. Though the body is dead, yet, the word yet is day, D-E. -E, that's a men day sequence in the Greek language. It's a powerful idea. If Christ is in you indwelling, though the body is dead, that's because, that's, because, that's to sin, that's positional sanctification, that's positional truth. 
It's not how you live. That's what he lived for you. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin as positional, just like I did in Galatians, yet the spirit, yet the spirit, and it, that's a little s, that's a human spirit, is alive because of righteousness, that's positional. It means that the spirit of the natural man of 1 Corinthians 2.14 that couldn't understand the things of God, the spirit of man of the unbeliever who does not understand the, the things of God has been brought to life with God. It, 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 the, the natural man, human spirit, has been brought alive. It is alive for God. It's alive for God. It was, he had a human spirit, but it wasn't alive for God. You've got to read 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through the third chapter, verse 3. You've got to be informed. And what brought it to life? What brought my human spirit to life with God? The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came in, he made my human spirit, he made it alive to God so that I can know the things of God that I can tap into the genius of the omniscience of God through the word of God. My, 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 my people, this ought to be a, a great Easter for you. This ought to be a great Easter for you. When the Holy Spirit, the, fourth, the fifth doctrinal point, was when the indwelling Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the mortal body of a church-age believer, his or her body is considered dead to sin. That, that is Adam's sin and the sin nature. Yet the human spirit has been made alive to God because of the mortal body being dead to sin is now alive as the naos of God. Listen, your body is, once you're saved, your body is called the naos, a temple where God dwells. Where God himself dwells. Through the Holy Spirit. My, my, my. This brings me to my final point in closing. This brings us to Paul's sixth doctrinal point in verse 11. In verse 11. Well, I jumped all over the place. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does if you believe the gospel... Then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life. Notice a compound word. Zoe is life. Poyeo is being made life. It's, it's being born again to your mortal bodies. Not your soul. To, to your mortal bodies. The emphasis on Paul, for Paul here is flesh versus spirit. It's not on soul versus body. And so he comes to the body issue. That's where I've spent all, all this time. I've spent on the body issue. Listen, you cannot live in the flesh and expect to have a life, uh, an abundant life with God in peace. You're at war with God if you know it or not. You're in a hostility position. You're in a hostile position to God. Just to satisfy your own, your own gratification of the flesh, which will never bring what you think you want. It will never. It's temporary pleasure, and it has consequences. Gee whiz. Well, we'll have a word of prayer. We'll take. We'll be dismissed. Uh, for some fellowship downstairs. Uh, we got some donuts probably. We got donuts. Whew, I uh, had, had a donut in a year. And then we'll be back for a celebration of music for this Easter with uh, the, Ed and some of the boys, the bridge builders. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll go downstairs. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray, Father, though we've stormed and 
romped and raved, I pray the message would be clear in the soul of the person. You can't live by the flesh. You've got to live in the power of the Spirit. There is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power. Not only in the blood, but what the blood brings is the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We need to be people of spiritual life. We need to, make, we need to set our minds not to live in the flesh, but to live in the Spirit. That's where life and peace and blessings come. In Jesus' name, amen.